Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're solely going to be talking about one of the superficial muscles of the anterior neck, and that's the muscle sternocleidomastoid. And we're going to see that sternocleidomastoid is going to be the primary cervical flexor and cervical rotator, meaning it's going to both flex the neck and rotate the neck. Here is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now if we look at the superior attachment up here, we see that it's really just one attachment. But if we go inferiorly to this attachment down here, we can actually see two clear distinct heads. So actually inferiorly, there's two heads of the sternocleidomastoid, and those are the sternal head, which is more medial, and the clavicular head, which is more lateral. And so we can take a zoom in here, and we can see there's a small space between those two heads, but again, two distinct heads, which really leads us to the origin of the muscle. The origin is really the manubrium of the sternum and the medial portion of the clavicle. Now, the part of the muscle that has its origin at the manubrium, that's of course the sternal head, the more medial aspect of the muscle, or the more medial head of the muscle. This has its origin right here on the manubrium. And then the lateral part of the muscle, which is the clavicular head, has its origin on the medial portion of the clavicle. Now, once these two heads ascend, you can see pretty quickly they fuse together and then travel as one large belly superiorly, where they're then going to insert mainly on the mastoid process. Okay. Now, the mastoid process, you can actually palpate this pretty easily. If you actually just take a finger and put it really right behind your ear, there's a bump right there, and, and that bump is the mastoid process, so very easy to palpate that. That's the primary insertion of sternocleidomastoid. There's also a small portion of the muscle that inserts on the superior nuchal line, really the more posterior part of the insertion over here. The superior nuchal line is really going around the occiput, and there's a little bit of insertion there. Okay, So here's your sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now this is one of the easiest muscles to palpate. Here's a picture right here. It's easiest to see when the neck is rotated. So this particular person is rotating their head or neck to the left. Remember, we're looking anteriorly, so this is the left side, here's the right side. Okay. So she's rotating her head to the left, and that causes you to be able to see the right sternocleidomastoid very easily. So when you're looking to palpate this muscle, you rotate your head in one direction, and the opposite sternocleidomastoid becomes very easy to see, or the contralateral sternocleidomastoid. So right here, you can see her right sternocleidomastoid. Now the clavicular head's a little bit harder to see down here, and also more difficult because the two heads are actually very close to one another. But we can at least see the origin down here, uh, particularly on the manubrium of the sternum. If we look right here, this would actually be where the jugular notch of the sternum is, or the, of the manubrium. So here's the origin right here. And we can see the muscle traveling superiorly, and we can see it going right behind her right ear. And this would be posterior to that. That would be where the uh, mastoid process is. Okay? So here's sternocleidomastoid on the right side. We can see a little bit of the sternocleidomastoid on the left side. Let me get rid of this arrow for a second. You can actually see a little bit maybe of the outline of it, but again when, you're, when you have your head turned to the left, the left sternocleidomastoid kind of fades in there. But if you look right here, you can see a little bit of it that would be traveling up toward her left ear, uh, behind it toward the left mastoid process. Okay. But again, here's your right sternocleidomastoid. Another thing we can also see here is the trapezius. Okay? I'll, I'll explain why that's relevant in a few minutes. But here's our trapezius on the posterior aspect of the neck. Okay? And then right here is the clavicle. And notice that, especially when you have your head turned to the left like this, the right sternocleidomastoid, the right clavicle, and the right trapezius sort of form this triangle right here. Not that that's super relevant, but it can be useful for conceptualizing where these muscles are. Okay, so let's go back here and now talk about the blood supply to sternocleidomastoid. Sternocleidomastoid mainly receives its blood supply through the occipital artery and the superior thyroid artery. Now, generally speaking, the superior part of the muscle is gonna receive its blood supply more from the occipital artery the inferior part of the muscle more from the superior thyroid artery. And to understand this, let's take a look at where these blood vessels are. Okay? Well, the occipital artery 
and the superior thyroid artery both originate from the external carotid artery. However, if we follow that external carotid artery upwards, we see that the occipital artery branches off much higher up than does the superior thyroid artery. And the occipital artery in general is really just going to serve mainly structures at the occiput of the skull on the outside of it, of course. But right here where my mouse is, this is basically where the mastoid process is. So any part of the sternocleidomastoid that's in this area is really going to be receiving its blood via that occipital artery. In contrast, the part of the sternocleidomastoid that exists inferiorly is going to receive its blood through the superior thyroid artery. Right here is the external carotid artery. It looks like it's more inside, but it'll end up being uh, more external. Here's the internal carotid artery. And then here's the carotid sinus, which is roughly where the common carotid artery actually uh, bifurcates into the internal and external branches. And pretty quick, right after that bifurcation occurs, we can see this artery branching off of the external carotid. And this one that goes inferiorly, this is the superior thyroid artery. And like we said, it's going to give off some branches toward the sternocleidomastoid, where it's going to be supplying more of the inferior, roughly two-thirds of the muscle. Now, why do I include the trapezius in this picture? Well, I include the trapezius really just because the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid share the same nervous innervation, particularly their motor innervation, which is by cranial nerve 11, also called the spinal accessory nerve, or just accessory nerve. So these two muscles are the two major muscles innervated by that nerve. So here's the spinal accessory nerve right here in yellow, cranial nerve 11. We talked about its structure more in a previous video when we talked about the cranial nerves, but for now, just recall that when it exits the skull, it's going to do so with cranial nerve number 10, that is the vagus nerve, and cranial nerve 9 through the jugular foramen, and they're going to exit inferiorly. So in green here, we have the vagus nerve, which we're not talking about. In yellow, we have the, the spinal accessory nerve, and notice when it exits that jugular foramen, it's going to turn more posteriorly. And when it does that, it's going to give off two branches, mainly. One is going to be to this muscle, which is, of course, sternocleidomastoid. But it's also going to give off another branch that you can see here is going to go toward the trapezius. And in fact, you can see here that this spinal accessory nerve branch to the trapezius is really just going to continue going all the way down the length of the trapezius, but it goes underneath the trapezius. Okay? In fact, if you look at the trapezius on a cadaver and you cut it and reflect the trapezius over so you're looking at the underside of the trapezius, you'll actually see the accessory nerve running along the deep part of the trapezius. Okay. But spinal accessory nerve innervates both of those muscles. Now coming back here, uh, the sternocleidomastoid actually has some other important functions in terms of its innervation. Um, it actually has a good deal of sensory innervation, and that sensory innervation is via the cervical plexus. And along the same lines as the sensory innervation, it also has a significant amount of proprioceptive innervation. So Certain muscles have different degrees of muscle spindles. Okay? Muscle spindles, recall, are certain types of receptors that allow the brain to monitor the length of a muscle. And that, with, combined with other information, allows the brain to discern uh, what the position is of a particular part of the body in space. The brain can actually take the length of the muscle and derive that information. And so the proprioceptive neurons are going to be coming from a C2 and C3 ventral rami. And they're going to be relaying information to the brain about the length of this particular sternocleidomastoid. And that could potentially help the brain discern the position of the head, uh, the degree of rotation, the degree of cervical flexion in space. Okay? And it turns out that the sternocleidomastoid has a significant amount of those muscle spindles relative to a lot of other muscles. So hopefully that makes sense. And now in terms of the actions of sternocleidomastoid, it depends on whether or not we're contracting both at the same time, which would be bilateral contraction, or only one of them, which would be unilateral. Let's talk about unilateral first. If we contract one sternocleidomastoid, we're going to get one of two things. Either contralateral cervical rotation, that is rotation of the neck in the opposite direction, or ipsilateral cervical flexion. So to understand contralateral cervical rotation, let's go back to this picture right here. This woman is turning her head to the left. So which one of these sternocleidomastoid muscles would be contracting? It would be the right one. 
So in actually you can see it bulging out here, which should give you an indication that this is actually the contracted one. So if her right sternocleidomastoid contracts by itself, that can facilitate rotation of the head to the left or rotation of the neck to the left. In contrast, if she rotated her head the other way, so if she contracted her left sternocleidomastoid, her head would rotate to the right. Okay? So with neck rotation, it's always contralateral with the sternocleidomastoid. Now, with ipsilateral cervical flexion, so bending your neck forward, so basically putting your chin to your sternum, you can basically do that either directly down the midline, or you can do it a little bit more to the right or a little bit more to the left. Okay? We're talking about here a little bit more to the left or right. So it's ipsilateral cervical flexion. So if you contracted, let's say, here's your left sternocleidomastoid in such a way that you did it ipsilaterally and it was producing a little bit of cervical flexion, contracting the left sternocleidomastoid would flex the neck down, but a little bit more to the left. So it would be ipsilateral. In contrast, if you contracted only the right sternocleidomastoid in such a way that it would cervically flex, it would cervically flex a little bit in the right direction. Okay? And so these are what we see with unilateral contraction. We normally are just considering the cervical rotation, though. That's a much more important motion to talk about. Now with bilateral contraction of both sternocleidomastoids, left and right, we just get general cervical flexion. So that's really just putting your chin all the way down to your manubrium of your sternum. Okay, So neck flexion. The other thing that both of these can do, just because they're actually inserting on the clavicle, is they can actually assist slightly in forced inhalation. Okay? Whenever you're inhaling normally at rest, you don't need this. Okay? But if you need to get in a lot of air and bring the rib cage and the entire thoracic cage up to increase the size of the thoracic cavity, it may actually start to involve a little bit of contraction of the sternocleidomastoid. Really just because if this muscle contracts and it brings the clavicle and the sternum closer to the mastoid process, that would result in a net elevation of the manubrium and a net elevation of the clavicle, which overall would increase the size of the thoracic cage, allowing a little bit more air to come into the lungs. Okay? But that would not become important unless you were doing very heavy exercise or doing a very forced inhalation. Okay? So hopefully the sternocleidomastoid muscle makes sense to you. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.